If you could rocket a piece of information into the brains of the general public about ADHD, what would it be? If you, if you can identify that, you can even come up with your own life hacks because then you know what you're actually trying to solve. It comes back to the first question that we were talking about and you were saying one of the biggest paradigm shifts that people with ADHD need to come to accept is the fact that... Especially like when it's one single person that's, that is like, hey, everybody else is getting it wrong. Guys, I figured it out. They usually haven't figured it out. Oh, you know what's heartbreaking is that in this whole thing that what you say you study and what people focus on, the most helpful thing is not mentioned and the most helpful thing is... A hello, hello. My name is Dante. I'm a registered psychologist from Australia. I work a lot with the ADHD community and I help people manage their ADHD symptoms as well as other mental health issues that co-occur with ADHD, things like anxiety and depression. In this episode, I'm joined by Antonia, an ADHD coach with years of experience both coaching and living with ADHD. We discuss solutions to ADHD's most common problems. We explore the biggest misunderstandings that both professionals and non-professionals have about ADHD. And we talk about what we consider to be some of the most important pieces of information about ADHD that we think everybody should know about. So I'll pass it over to you, Antonia. Can you maybe just introduce yourself? Hi, I am a um, YouTuber and ADHD coach for many, many years. And I'm also a scientist. I live in Germany and I'm very passionate about ADHD. That's probably the most important part. Also, I have a cat. What is the cat's name? <laughs> Leah. <laughs> she's right there. Oh, is she watching the stream right now? She is, but I don't think she's very interested. Fun fact, I read in a oh, book right. that pets are really helpful for ADHD and they give you all these positive hormones. So I knew it. So you everyone should just stock up on cats. Is that tip number one? <laughs> we just collect as many as possible? <laughs> Probably dogs, but yeah, uh, cats work too. Dogs, yeah, yeah. Because they love you so much. Do you think they do? But their cats are much more low maintenance than dogs. That's my favorite thing about it, to be honest. But yeah, you also get the amount of love that you put in, I guess. That's true. That's true. I feel like um, managing like twenty cats is something that you know some people can can pull off. Twenty dogs in like one house feels like a bit of a different situation. Oh God, no! I would not be able to manage that. Though I've heard some people say that it makes you be more careful and more aware of your environment when you have a dog and that helps them stay present. But also I find it kind of stressful and I don't want to put it on another living being to make me more concentrated. I don't want to risk their health. Yeah, I think I think dogs can be like particularly really good for like other maybe like mental health things like depression particularly, right? Probably. Um, I've worked with so many people and they're like, yeah, dude, the one thing keeping me going, it's, it's like this dog. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's a start. That's... <laughs> I'm glad that this dog is uh, currently six years old and not 16. That's a, that's a good place to be in. Oh God, yeah. that's the kind of thing that makes me cry. It's so sweet. It is, it's very sweet. Dogs are, dogs are amazing. We do not deserve them. Do you have a dog? I do have a dog. Right now he's probably like clawing at the door over there. <laughs> Let me in. <laughs> but he's probably making sound if you let him in. Oh yeah, oh yeah. He's uh, he's a bit out of line. He's meant to be ostensibly a therapy dog in training, but um, the one time I've let him into the room, he took a poo on the carpet <laughs> and wouldn't stop licking the person's feet. So <laughs> I guess that's a kind of therapy for something. Look, it's um, we're expanding the range of tolerance that the person has for um, intense smells. <laughs> Aroma sensory therapy. Sensory integration therapy. <laughs> Aromatherapy, yes. <laughs> nice. Very unique series of treatments. If you could rocket a piece of information into the brains of the general public about ADHD, what would it be? So what do I wish people knew about ADHD? What ADHD actually is. That is the biggest thing because there is so much stigma and misunderstanding that is preventing people from being identified, seeking treatment, making use of the treatment, even if they if they get to it and a lot of that is due to the misunderstanding so it's not about not being able to focus it's not being hyperactive it's not just a struggle that you have at work or at school it's a complex disorder that affects everything that you do it's it's in your nervous system so your brain that is related to how you sleep how you eat how you behave with other people every decision that you make every feeling it's the list of symptoms is endless and it cannot just be put down to focus and hyperactivity. It 
school or at work. And it would be so when wonderful said, if people understood that. When you said that the stigma around it or the misunderstandings around it prevent people from like both getting treatment and even like utilizing the treatment when it's offered to them, is that something that you encounter a lot? Yes, yes, because they people, even after we talk about problems so many times, there's still that voice in the back of their heads that's like, maybe I am just lazy, My, maybe I am just pretending and I'm not actually struggling that bad and I don't need this. And so they don't allow themselves to, to do the things that we talk about because they think they don't deserve it. Yeah, well, okay, that took a really different turn to the answer I was expecting. That's really, really interesting. So you feel that like in some ways the, I guess the negativity, the negative voice inside the person's own mind, the self-critical voice is just like so ingrained that they don't let themselves utilize the solutions that are given to them because they're like, I shouldn't need these solutions. I should just be able to do these things. Yes, be because we oversimplify the problem. When you have a, a simple problem, the solution sounds like it should be simple. Just do those things, just focus, but because people think that it is about focus, but it's not, it's about everything. And it takes so long to get people to accept that and truly understand themselves. Really, that's the biggest change that we make in coaching. It's not learning some specific strategy or a tool or a hack. It's giving people the understanding and actually for them to recognize it and be able to act upon that. That's the biggest change that they can make. Do you find a lot of resistance towards people when you tell them that like you can't give them a quick hack? Or taking a step back from that, do you even do you get people that come to you just being like, hey, what are the three life hacks that are going to you know, fix everything for me? Yes, and it breaks my heart, especially because people want such incredible hacks that will make them catch up for any time that they feel like is lost. And I just don't have that. But you can't say that to people. And so I try to ter take them on a different path. There is a lot of resistance to it, but eventually when the experience sinks in when they have tried it a few weeks to understand themselves to take things at their own pace it starts to it starts working and it starts clicking and it's really wonderful to see i want to follow that up with what do you think is the biggest mistake that people with adhd are fairly consistently making oh well it was going to be that um, the misunderstanding ourselves because of the stigma and the misinformation that everybody else is um, spreading around. So they act like we're lazy or undisciplined and we believe it. So we just want to fix ourselves in the ways that we're taught by neurotypicals would fix those simple problems, but they don't work for us. So we just keep trying and trying and trying until we are completely overwhelmed and burned out and exhausted and very often depressed so no matter what you see us doing i promise you on the inside we're not resting we're blaming ourselves for not working we're ashamed we're berating ourselves and it just makes it so much harder to actually change things i mean i've done it all of my coaches have done it we're just constantly beating ourselves up before we get diagnosed we think we're lazy and awful and after that we think there has to be some magic solution that will help us catch up on the lost time. So, and especially because we have those good days every day and again, where we have extra good energy and focus, and we think that we have to catch up, we do super much, way too much. So then we get tired and we have a bunch of bad days and it's just this vicious cycle that keeps repeating itself until we are completely exhausted. And so, what people come to me seeing is I'm overwhelmed, I'm burnt out, I'm exhausted, but they don't see the root cause of the problem was this misunderstanding. And it is this cycle of beating yourself up and overdoing it. And um, the solution to that is very counterintuitive as well. So it's very hard to get people to try it. And it's let go of trying harder, slow down, stop trying to catch up and Take care of yourself, like build a foundation of self-care and rest in your life and then work on top of that. But you have to go slowly and pace yourself. So a lot of understanding and acceptance. Do you find that a lot of people have difficulty actually just believing this to be true, right? Because even 
hearing this now, right? The message of in order to fix your problem, you actually need to like take a big step back and stop trying to like fix all your problems. Um, it just, it sounds like a really brutal message, right? Because no one wants to take a problem one step at a time. You want to fix all your problems immediately. You don't want to have to be like, I've got 15 problems and I'm working on 5% of one problem for the next week. Oh yeah. Right? That, that doesn't sound like an inspiring message, right? Have you found a way to package that so that it's more digestible for people? Trust me, bro. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, mostly it's stories and examples that help them because we really do believe that we're the only one that's going through that. And so when people come, they, they're like, I'm probably the worst person you've ever seen. You've never seen someone so horribly lazy like me. And I'm like, first of all, you're not lazy. Second of all, no, you're not. Everybody says that. And um, this and this person did that. And now it's going this way for them. So just trust me. I call it searching for evidence. So it still feels like you're doing mm -hmm. something. Search for evidence that this does help you. And you don't have mm -hmm. to believe it for now. Just search for the evidence for now. Yeah. Okay. I, I really like that. So it's, it's using, it's using examples as being like, Hey, look, this is where it's worked before. This is how this person managed to do it. What would you like mental health professionals to understand better about ADHD slash how would you like mental health professionals to act better in relation to the people with ADHD that they work with? So I haven't heard many complaints about ADHD specialists treating ADHD people, but general mental health professionals treating ADHD people, I have heard about and I believe the problem is that they treat so many different things that they can't possibly be an expert on everything and be, as, be able to answer every question about every single thing that they treat, at least not off the top of their heads. So they probably shouldn't, but sometimes they do. And I wish they were more careful about what they told people with ADHD because it's a particularly invisible disorder. So usually, or for many people, they are the first person who has ever believed you have ADHD, who has seen you and given you any understanding. So we think of them as gods. We will take any word they say and they have to be extra careful about what they say. And if they don't know, I think it's important that they say, I don't know, instead of making some good enough answer that might not be good enough in the long run. For example, my therapist was like, you know, ADHD wasn't a problem back in the stone age or whatever. The society is a problem. And it felt profound at the time, mm. but what am I supposed to do with that? It's not like I can escape society. It's not like I can change society by myself. <clears throat> so I need something better than that. And in the moment, it just made me feel powerless. How can I yeah. change it? Yeah, I think, this is a, a big personal, personal gripe of mine with the whole, the, it's not the whole ADHD sphere, but there's like a particular part of it that is very much like, it's not you, it's not your brain, it's not a disorder, it's society, it's the culture, it's we don't exist to live in a room and do this. And, it, and the way they frame it is that somehow if I took you and teleported you into the jungle, somehow your ADHD would be this massively adaptive trait. It's like, no, if you can't focus on gathering berries for five minutes because you get distracted following a butterfly and then you get mauled by a saber tooth. That's not adaptive. Like, just, there's, people try to come up with these examples of like how ADHD could actually be an evolutionarily adaptive trait. Um, I don't see it. I don't see, like, yeah, I could take you and put you into a desert. It's not, you don't have higher survival odds because you can't maintain your attention where it needs to go. You have lower survival odds, right? You're gonna get distracted while you're looking for water and die. <laughs> to be honest, I, it, I've thought it the same. It blows my mind. I, I think it comes from a good place. I genuinely think it comes from a good place where it's like, hey, let's take a strengths-based approach or like, hey, you know, like we don't wanna make people's self-esteem super low. Like, hey, your brain isn't like this terrible thing. You're not broken, which is true. Um, but you can say that without saying, actually your brain is this magical gift and you're just in the wrong environment. Oh God. It's like, no, like you've got challenges that are making your life harder than it needs to be. There's remedies that can reduce the load of these challenges and make your life a bit closer to normal difficulty. Like you started playing on hard mode. You don't need to play on hard mode. You can bring it down to, you know, closer to regular. Yeah, I, so I think it comes from a good place where we're trying to tell people like you're not broken, which is true. Like you're not this 
a, you're not a write-off, but that doesn't mean it's actually like this magical thing. Schizophrenia is not an adaptive trait and yeah. people are just in the wrong environment. People say that only about ADHD right. because we aren't as clearly suffering because they see only the outside. Uh, you can't focus your hyperactive part of it. Mm. They don't see, I don't know, that I eat hot tofu yeah. from the pan and I almost choked to death because I, I just didn't think. I'm like, oh, yes. And yes. I almost died. Yes. I don't know how that's an evolutionary yes. advantage. Yeah, they see people, they're like, oh, yes, the, yeah, the impulsivity, the difficulty with um, emotional regulation, right? Like, these are not adaptive traits. Just because people think like, oh, your attention jumps super fast, so you'll catch the predator faster. It's like, no, your attention jumps super fast, so you get distracted away from the rustling bush, and you're watching, like, something over there, oh, and now you go, It's so true. Like, what makes you think your attention is jumping to the relevant stimuli? It's not. That's why it's a disorder. It's jumping to the wrong stimuli you're more likely to get distracted away from the rustling Oh, I'm so bush. glad you said yeah. that. It, I feel so bad voicing that opinion because I really wish I could give a silver lining to people. And so I'm very careful about what I say. But in all honesty, especially in the way that we've made society, it's really hard. We could make it a lot easier for people if society was set up differently. Yes. But it's really yes. hard. I can't find a silver lining to people being jobless and to earning less money and struggling at school and being um, yeah. bullied and isolated. There's, I think, Russ Barkley recently did a video comparing like his point of view um, against another person's point of view, like is ADHD a gift or a curse, right? Um, and one of the points he brings up is for some people, living a life of adversity allows them to unlock or enhance personality characteristics that bolster their success. And maybe without that adversity, um, they wouldn't have succeeded. I remember when I was in school, there was some guy who came to my school and he had like no arms and no legs. And now he's like a motivational speaker and he has a good career and a wife and, and whatever, right? Um, he probably wouldn't have been as successful if he didn't lose his arms and his legs. That doesn't yes. mean he's not disabled. He has no arms and legs. Like just because the adversity has made him mentally stronger or financially successful or whatever it is, right? And in, that's a very rare subset True. of people. Um, you know, that doesn't mean we should go around <laughs> chopping off people's arms and legs because, hey, it made this guy's life a bit better, right? It's not, you know it's what's not really work. important with that and could potentially be the root cause of the issue is that I feel like in Western society, we struggle to separate two things. Um, so, for example, how you feel about a person can be both bad and good at the same time. You don't have to make up your mind. So ADHD can be yeah. bad, and maybe somebody can use it to, be, to have it be good, but it doesn't change the fact that it's bad. There's a lot of, um, yeah, I guess there's a lot of just like categorical splitting that we tend to do, right? And then, or even when we talk about things in one context, we'll talk about it as all good. And then in another context, we can acknowledge that it's bad, but we acknowledge it as like all bad in another context. Um, I see this a lot as a psychologist whenever I do like relationship or couples work. Right? It'll be my partner today, they're amazing, they're the greatest, they bought me flowers, blah, blah, blah. Next week, they're the worst, True. I told them to pack their bag and get out of here. It's like, depending on the moment in time, your partner is like amazing or they're terrible, but it, it's not. At all moments in time, they are simultaneously both and many things in between as well. And when it comes to even disorders like ADHD, simultaneously, they are always a bunch of bad maybe a bit of good and some things in between that like can depend on the situation but it's all it's it's never like one or the other it's always all of them simultaneously uh, but i think the human mind just struggles with that concept that you can be black and white at the same time not just depending on the context yes but at the same time. yeah yin yang i think that's the idea of it like darkness and the light light and the darkness like, it can exist i think actually this kind of thinking is related to the biggest mistake that we make where we keep trying to push ourselves and then burn out and then have a good day and, and um, again try and then burn out again is a thing I read called um, hot, the hot cold empathy gap where when you're hot or experiencing a certain kind of motivation or feeling you can't imagine ever feeling cold again or you cannot empathize with yourself in the other situation and when you're cold for example, um, you're not um, super in love like the first two months or three months with your partner. You can't imagine how could you act like that. You underestimate how much certain stimulation can affect you. And that way, like when you're having a great day, you can't imagine the bad day where the next day you'll be like, oh, why did I do that? And when you're having a bad day, 
you can't imagine how you will feel if you if you had that energy again so you act as if there's no tomorrow yes yeah it's it's a complete it's like this is how i am right now therefore this is the reality whatever happened in the past <laughs> that was a fever dream it was a hallucination whatever like it doesn't count right this is how i am now ergo this is how i'm going to be for every day of every minute for my future and like, there's only ever now that. especially with adhd yeah so i think getting people to understand that. I, I, one of these examples I use often with children who struggle with perspective taking, but it works. It's an example that I think works for everybody. You know those optical illusions where it's like a picture and if you view it from the left, it's like a woman's face, yeah. from the right, it's like a man's face. It's not, if you view it from the right, it's not a man's face. If you view it from the left, it's not a woman's face. It's simultaneously both all the time. The, the face doesn't change when you view it. <laughs> it's the same. It, it's both faces simultaneously so always. True. Um, similarly, in relationships, your partner is both good and bad always. It's not about whether you look at them on bad day or good day. It's always good and bad simultaneously. It's just kind of the perspective that you're currently viewing yes, it through. Yes, probably a good thing for mental health professionals to also mention, because I imagine there's some that are like, oh, well, don't worry, it's a gift, and others that are like, uh, you got this, you're fine. Yeah. Don't even acknowledge it. It was, it was good back in the day, so... You're fine now. <laughs> if anything, I feel like that would make me feel slightly disheartened if someone told that to me because it would be like, well, <laughs> yes. I was born in like the wrong era and now my cooked brain can't ever fit into the society. Yes. It's like um, when the advice should actually be like, hey, look, you started life on hard mode. Um, you can still win games if you play on hard mode. It's just harder. But here's like solutions that can bring you back down to like normal mode. Will life ever be on easy mode for you? Like probably not. But like, can you play on normal? Yeah. No, that's a wonderful and realistic sentiment. And uh, what my psychiatrist told me is we need all kinds of people and you have your place and you have things that you can do differently because of the way you are. So I don't wish for you to be fixed or be in a different timeline. That's just how it is. Yeah. Imagine saying that to someone who has like severe suicidal depression. You're like, hey, we need, we need the <laughs> oh, struggling no. artists in the world. Okay, that's, that's true. That's true. It's like, uh -huh. <laughs> so they have to be super careful about what they say. I mean, I don't, it's hard for me to think of yeah. an ADHD or that I know that does not have depression or like some level of it. Um, mm. A lot of my coaches are diagnosed with yeah. depression as well. So we, we will beat ourselves up and we will read super yeah. much into what you tell us. So be a... Be very careful about that. That's a huge responsibility. And I think obviously the people who are willing to go and like pay for coaching or pay for a psychologist, they're going to be the people typically on the more extreme ends of whatever like difficulties they're having. The people who have like fairly mild ADHD, you and I probably don't encounter them because they're True. managing it, right? But even if you look at the data, the comorbidity of like ADHD with depression, with anxiety, it's incredibly high, just astronomically yes. high. Yes, and um, yeah. we've been probably, most of us have been there at different times in our lives. I have. It was not a great experience. So even the people who are doing better at the moment n know what it's like to feel really, really bad. Yeah, that's actually, that's a really good point. Yeah, it's not, again, you're not at the point you are and you stay there forever. You can go through relatively good periods of time, whether that's months or years. Um, but maybe that's because you had to go through really rough times in the past and get a lot of support to get there. Yes, in the first place. support. So important. So helpful. The power of love. I used to think how, how much can it help? Um, just like just like my coaches. And uh, so I'm definitely not immune to this. Uh, many years ago, I was like, what is the right strategy going to be that will fix it? And actually, it was slowing down, restructuring everything, making it ADHD friendly and a lot of support, connections, understanding and love. That's nice. That's amazing that you had that and that you actually got through Lucky. all of that. Interesting story. Yeah. Um, I think really at work, so a lot of people come struggling at work because that's where it's mo most noticeable for others. And then they make consequences for us. The coaches that are most supported at work, so they have a good environment, regardless of how well they're doing the actual job, are the happiest, whereas others could be like incredible experts, but if they're not supported, they are so sad. I think it comes down to, I, I look at the fundamental pillars of like what makes a person healthy, right? When a person comes to me for like their initial session for psychology, I always ask about like four main things. Um, it's like diet, sleep, exercise, and your social network and support. And if any one of these are like completely cooked, like 
it's over. You know, like I can sit here and try and reframe all of your thoughts until the cows come home. But if you have no friends or like you're convinced that your friends hate you um, or you're sleeping like two hours a night and living off of Dunkin' Donuts, like we're not, we're not going to get very far. Like, That's I, so I important. Say. But um, I have to warn you, many are stuck in this cycle where they're trying to catch up on work. And that's why they're not taking care of themselves. Yeah. It's, it's not that they're not trying, but they believe yeah. once my work life is ready, once I'm focused and productive at work, then I'll take care of that. When it's really the other way around. Like we speak about work-life balance as if you can work if you're dead. Like you have to take care of your life first. Yeah, I, it com yeah. It comes back to the first question that we were talking about and you were saying one of the biggest paradigm shifts that people with ADHD need to come to accept is the fact that if you actually want to make improvements, you have to, in a way, tune back the degree of improvements you're trying to implement at one time because you, you keep trying to push, 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 push. Um, it just leads to this big cycle of negativity because you can't accomplish it because you're setting unrealistic goals. So then you're just like really harsh on yourself and then you get like depressed and then your sleep is cooked and then you get yes. this massive negative spiral. So in a way, taking a step back and slowing down on your goals and reducing the height of your goals actually lets you reach them. Um, whereas setting massively high goals sounds really nice, feels good when you set them, um, but then feels terrible because you oh never Oh my God, yes. Them. And you actually end up doing less in the long run. If you, if you set a lot of goals, you complete maybe 10, 20%. If you set small goals and you go at it every day, it's so much more progress, so much faster. What are some uncommon strategies that you've seen work surprisingly well for yourself or people that you've worked with? So um, medication, just kidding. <laughs> but I, I wanna put that out there that once you get medication, all the other strategies just work so much better. There is no, going around that, there is no strategy that's more powerful than that, even though people will try to convince you so, especially people who don't have ADHD and don't know how hard it can be. But other than that, walks every time somebody goes for a walk and really enjoys it they always come the next week and they're like wow it was wonderful i could let so many thoughts out i felt physically active like walks always make us happy but it's so hard to get yourself out the door so you have to find ways i call it putting a carrot on a stick but you have to also not let yourself know that you're putting the carrot on the stick something to to bait you to go outside so you feel motivated. What I will do is mm. I will dress for a walk and act like I'm not going to force myself or anything. I, I could go anytime if I wanted to. So I put everything on and put the shoes on and maybe I will put on some music that makes me feel active and then and then go. Because waking up or, or being around and thinking to yourself, I have to go for a walk, that feels like a responsibility. But getting dressed for it and being like, oh, now I could go, that feels fun. Yeah, okay, so you break it down into some smaller steps and you go, hey, I'll just, I'll just do like the first step and, and see what happens. I'll just put on like walking clothes and I'll see what happens. I'll just put on like a little bit of energizing music. I don't have to do steps three and four if I don't want to. Just, yes. just do step two. Well, now I've done step two. I'll just, I'll just do step three if, and, and yeah, that's all. Yeah, it's, step three is a no small pressure. step. No yeah. pressure. You're basically taking what distracts us yeah. in other situations and trying to recreate it yourself. Like if you have, I don't know, you're, you're working on something and then you have this amazing recipe idea and suddenly you run around to the, and make it like right now, kind of like that, but with something that you actually want to do. You're acting like the walk is the recipe. So you're, you're setting it up to distract you and to take you out on an exciting adventure versus being like, I will have to go do that now. I love one of the things that you said um, that people report to you when they go for the walk. They're like, oh, I got so many like thoughts out, you know, it just, uh, it let me process, right? And this is one of the biggest things I tell to people who come to me and they're like, Dante, every time I go to sleep, I hit the bed and then my mind just starts like machine gunning thoughts at me. Um, and it's like, oh, interesting. Is there any other point in your day where you're like sitting there and doing nothing and letting yourself think? And they're like, no, I like wake up and I work for like 12 hours and then I'm like, you know, working on this assignment and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay. So you literally have no time for your brain to think except for when oh you hit the God. bed. Relatable. <laughs> Interesting. When do you think your brain's going to do the thinking yes, then? Yes, <laughs> I see it as like um, yeah. when we're living our life without thinking or taking the time apart from everything to think. It's like you're driving and you're just driving and you have no idea where you're going. 
Um, the walk is kind of a time to take out the map and be like, do I actually want this goals? Do I want to see this friend? Do I want to do that thing? And so the thoughts come out for ADHDers, extra relaxing because they are so active. And once they're out, you can do other things so much better as well. Any other amazing hacks? Um, one awesome hack is uh, finding good ADHD friends because that's how you normalize your struggles. Even if you have a lot of friends, but they're neurotypical, it, it, it's, it's going to be different. It's, it's another special feeling like you need extra ADHD friends to share your struggles with, to feel understood, to have that connection. You, you can also meet them online if you have to, like go to Reddit slash ADHD. It's still better than being alone with your struggles. Um, maybe random related to that, but um, frozen meals. A lot of us struggle with cooking. And when you say frozen meals, people imagine pizza. But nowadays there is like super healthy pre-packaged broccoli with rice or whatever that you can make in five minutes. My fridge is full of frozen meals. They're like this boxes and, and it, it's five minutes and it's so healthy. We need to check your frozen section. Also those, those um, meal replacement bars and shakes. They're, good. They're better than eating like cheese squares from the fridge, which is what I used to do for a long time. <laughs> um, eating a light lunch as well, because we get that slump from two to four. And I have found eating a light lunch, I haven't had a slump in, in months. It's amazing. I usually have those meal replacement shakes instead. And because it's a shake, I guess it's easier to digest and I can be active around afternoon instead of just sleeping around. <laughs> That's a, a, a wrong expression, I believe. But uh, yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> do, you, do you ever get the urge to... So I, I am a big fan of light lunches. But every time the clock hits 12, I just get this urge to devour a foot-long Subway <laughs> sandwich and then go into a food coma immediately <laughs> afterwards. Um, and I don't learn from my mistakes. Do you get this urge? And if you do, how do you overcome oh, this? Oh, so it really helps if those are lunches that I believe protein keeps you sated for longer and things that are complex carbohydrates. So sometimes I have for breakfast just oatmeal and um, protein powder and yogurt, vegan yogurt. And that keeps me sated until like 1, 2 p.m. Then I have those shakes before I have the time to think about the pizza or the foot long. <laughs> Just like make it really fast. <laughs> make okay, the hunger so, pass. Right. So setting up in advance, setting up in advance, setting up in the morning so that you're not getting like the giant cravings yes. in the middle of the day. Yeah. Any other, any other surprising tips or life hacks for the ADHD? Yes. I think environment is super important. It's so much easier to change it than to change your brain. So... One thing I love is cleaning up and changing the environment to whatever I need at the moment. So I'll put everything off of my desk, but I won't like put it away carefully somewhere. I get a big box, put it in the box, cover the box. And when I'm done, I can put the stuff back or I can walk around with the box and return it to its, its rightful places. But that just saves you from going on the cleaning tangent. And when you have your, your space clean in front of you, it just helps you focus because working through visual signals takes up a huge part of your brain's activity and you just see it. If you don't see it, you're saving a lot of executive function trying to resist whatever you're seeing. Let's say your iPad is right there and you're actually trying to, I don't know, paint or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So environmental management so that you don't have to waste executive power on doing things like it's, it's there's just not an option. There's not an option for distraction. Yes. I made this video where it's like um, five focusing hacks and actually for, for effortless focus. And they actually are for effortless focus because we're talking about visual hacks where you're just cleaning the space, then you don't have to put in the effort to ignore it. Hearing, so you um, close the windows, I don't know, put your noise canceling headphones on and you don't have to put in the effort to ignore all these things. Uh, smell, you, you don't, I don't know, cook croissants and make yourself hungry while you're actually trying to work. Open the window, get that fresh air um, feeling. So you want comfy clothes, a comfy space, something maybe to fidget with, something to walk on. Walking pad really helps. And taste. So with taste, the hack is that thing where you eat lighter lunches and um, have those emergency snacks instead of constantly making yourself think about food, maybe because you have a lot of sugar and sugar is addictive. God, the cravings I used to have. <laughs> mm. 
So yeah, effortless. What are some of the mistakes that you've learned from by managing your own ADHD and working with people with ADHD that you think other people could learn from and learn to avoid? So assuming that they know what ADHD actually is, hands down, is the biggest thing. So again, when people come to ask for a strategy or how to manage it or finally make it work or whatever, they, they're not really thinking about the origins, about what it means, about what is the background of it, but actually it's really important because strategies, no one strategy will work forever and you need a lot of them. So you know when you have a certain problem, you will use a certain strategy, not always the same strategy, and that's where you need understanding. And you really need to explain to people, what is executive dysfunction? But actually, like, what are the seven things that we struggle with? What is hyperactivity? What is inattention? What is trauma that comes from being undiagnosed for so many years? And you need to make sure that people understand it and they learn the skill of, okay, I was procrastinating. Why was it? Which ones of the actual underlying problems was it that caused me to procrastinate in that moment? Was it emotional dysregulation? Was it a motivational problem? What was it? So I try to teach coaches to do that because when they, when they learn to do that, they can solve their own problems. They don't need to come for me, to, to me to, uh, to tell them, use this strategy for that struggle. And not even my psychiatrist explained to me what exactly is executive dysfunction. We seem to assume that people kind of have this general understanding of it, but they don't. You really need to drill it into them. Yeah, I, I think, I'm not sure like what the education state is like in your country, but in Australia, the first time I ever heard executive functioning was like, when I'd finished university and started working as a psychologist, it was, it, it, it's just not a, you know, it's just not a thing that is taught about they or can't talked know. about. They have some nebulous idea of what it is. I'm not saying that it's wrong, but with the nebulous idea, you cannot properly diagnose the struggle and find the right strategy. So definitely, if you can, explain them what it is exactly and test them on it to make sure that they understand. Yeah, I, okay, so the big mistake, I guess if I was to summarize that, is not being able to actually identify what the cause of specific problems is. Instead, just like looking for like, what's the life hack for this? What's the quick tip for that? But if you can actually figure out like which underlying aspect of executive functioning or which underlying area of ADHD is causing this specific problem, then you know which solution to yes. actually implement. Um, and you don't need to keep searching for like new life hacks every single week, every single time you have a problem. You just need to be able to identify like what's causing this specific problem and then yeah. address that. If you, if you can identify that, you can even come up with your own life hacks because then you know what you're actually trying to solve. If you're just solving procrastination again, and the actual problem is emotional dysregulation. So somebody hurts you, you can't let it go. And so you're not working and you go on online and you look for procrastination hacks and they're like, well, I don't know, set a timer, make yourself stressed. And you're like just sitting there crying and wondering why it's not working. It's not gonna help. Yes, yeah, so you're applying solutions to address like time management issues when it's just, it's not a time management yes. issue. Yeah, I, I really like that one. That's a great, I think that's a great both mistake to learn from and tip in general, as well as like overarching approach of like, how do you actually fix ADHD? It's like, understand the underlying me mechanisms that make it difficult. And I don't mean like, well, in the amygdala, <laughs> there's a dopamine pathway that goes, like that doesn't, who cares? But like, you know, is it emotional regulation? Is it time blindness? Is it you know, this or that? Like which specific function is not working and then find the actual solution yes. that's gonna help with that. Knowledge is power. I'm going to tangent here. When you were learning about ADHD, and I guess even more so learning about your own ADHD or how to help people with ADHD, did you spend like a significant amount of time or any time at all like learning about the neurobiology and neurochemistry of ADHD? Yes, yes. For you, did you find that to be a useful investment of your time? Uh, no, not, not really in the way that it was productive or effective because especially because we don't have any straight answers at the moment, even though people would love to give them if they could. Um, yes. There's so many- People love to give them anyway. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> hey, <laughs> that really grinds you my see, gears. The problem, the problem is, the problem is just, it's just dopamine, really. It's just dopamine. So you just need to directly inject dopamine into your prefrontal cortex. And as long as your dopamine is high and you don't dopamine crash yourself in the morning by dopamine fasting yourself at night and going into a dopamine deficit, that everything's going to be dopamine all right. It's like, 
Okay. <laughs> what do you do with that information? Nothing. But like, yeah. God, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, 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 and when and when experts a giant say frustration these, I have. Yeah. when experts say these things about dopamine, low dop it's just low dopamine. And my coaches come to me and they're like, "Well, why don't I have dopamine?" <laughs> and I'm like, "What? You have? I'm I'm sure you have." But the brain is such a complex thing; we don't understand it. And like, what we understand is those yeah. backgrounds, those foundations that we talked about. Yeah. Giving wrong answers. And, and also, it's it, it's worse than <laughs> yes. It, it's worse than saying I don't know because for us who are actually trying to to find and say the correct things, it takes so much more work to undo whatever misunderstandings other people <clears throat> caused than if they just hadn't said anything. Yes. And from a professional standpoint, when I'm trying to upgrade my knowledge because I want to help people better and I want to be better at my job, right? I don't have infinite time to study in the week, right? I need to make sure that what I'm researching and what I'm studying and what I'm training in is actually an efficient use of my time. Um, so one of the frustrations I have at myself, but I guess more particularly like the online education sphere as a whole is that so, there's so much focus on like brain region and neural circuitry and neurotransmitters. And I spent hundreds of hours learning about all of these things. And then I come to realize in my clinical practice, it's useless. It is useless. Yes. I'm not going to sit someone down and be like, hey, have you heard about the periaqueductal gray? It's this really interesting region <laughs> of the brain. <laughs> in, in what realm is this producing like reduction in symptoms? Like, it's just, it's not. Yeah. It sounds like a lovely tangent to go on, but it's not actually helpful as in like a rabbit hole to study no. for ages. But if you, if we do want to yes. help people, we have yes. to help them understand themselves and the things that we know for sure. Yes. Um, and I think it's valuable for some people to know this and go down these rabbit holes. If you're researching neuroscience and neurobiology and neurochemistry, and maybe if you're in the pharmaceutical industry and you're trying to figure out like new drug compounds and where they target and what they target, this is going to be obviously things you need to know about. But the problem is when you are like someone with ADHD or you're a clinician trying to learn more about like how do you help people with ADHD, you go onto like YouTube and you're like, teach me about ADHD, right? And you're gonna come across like a Huberman video or something like that. And they'll just be like, let me tell you about the underlying neurobiology of ADHD. And it's like, why does a 15 year old who's struggling to like function need to know this? <laughs> but he doesn't tell you the underlying uh, neurobiology of ADHD though. Oh, that's true. Oh, I that's spent true, that's months true. studying his Sorry, ADHD I'm, video yeah. and he does not say that. He doesn't give even the that's DSM right. definition true. of it. Yeah, he doesn't even go that deep. Yeah, sorry, I, I've just come across so many other ADHD influences or people who've put out courses like whole courses on ADHD and then half the course is talking about neurobiology and neurochemistry it's like who is this for is, is your audience going to go and develop like new drugs <laughs> oh wow but also you know because of that hot and cold empathy gap that we talked about I believe mm. not even I realize uh, well enough when I'm under the uh, certain excitement or whatever it would be let's say dopamine mm. and super following the dopamine like in that moment you don't realize it there is the self-awareness struggle yes. and there is this empathy gap where you're like I don't remember what it was like for me yesterday to not have this and so it's not helpful it's just not a good use of time I think in to, to research and get in depth in this unless it's going to be a specific like career focus of yours um, I just don't like how much training information online gets devoted to this and just feels like such an inefficient use of time both for people struggling with ADHD who just want to learn about like what do I actually do which is what you said figure out like the underlying aspects of executive functioning how to address those or for clinicians which is help people to identify their underlying executive functioning difficulties and how to address those like that's all that like should be focused on you know what's heartbreaking is that in this whole thing that's what you say you study and what people focus on the most helpful thing is not mentioned. And the most helpful thing is acceptance. Like that's the thing that makes the difference yeah. massive for coaches. Suddenly when they accept it, they're like, you know what? I did it my way. I did it the way that works for me and it worked great. Until there is that acceptance, they will keep trying things that don't work. They will keep burning themselves out and they don't teach acceptance. What do you think is the best approach to combating misinformation about mental health generally and specifically with ADHD? I think we need more media literacy and critical thinking classes in school. Like if they could do that, even if it's just one seminar, it would help so much because we need to learn that we shouldn't trust even experts on everything they say just because they are experts. We still can question them. We still can do our own research. And it doesn't mean like question every word they say, but just be aware 
these are humans that are at work and just because they're wearing this specific uniform does not make them faultless like humans are always faulty prone to mistakes prone to misunderstanding and yeah we, we trust them way too much because there's this authority aura of, of, of experts and with mental health mm. especially again mm. those general practitioners they, they can't have every disorder that they are treating so if they're not really careful what they're saying and to who they're saying it it can be even more harmful so we need to understand the foundations ourselves make some research and then take their opinion as an opinion not the absolute truth for some for a lot of people actually i was going to say for some people but for a lot of people it's hard to have i guess the time to be able to do that like counterfactual research um but also a lot of people aren't trained in like how to do research or like they can read a research paper, but they don't know, is this a good one? Is this a bad one? They don't, maybe they're not even aware that like bad research papers yes. exist, right? Um, so obviously ideal world, we would like upskill everybody to be able to do that. Um, but in the meantime, are there any sources of ADHD information that you found to be like very reliable where they like very rarely get things wrong in your opinion? Yes, Russell Barkley. <laughs> Other than yourself, Me, of I, I, I mean, of course. Yes. Everything on Antonia's universe, everything under Dante psychology, <laughs> flawless, flawless. Never a mistake made, never a word uttered falsely. No, don't trust me. <laughs> don't, don't, don't take everything that I say for, for truth. I, I can also make, make mistakes. And I, I would love for people to, to correct me, but I do my best to do research, put the resources in the description, but it is already helpful to see whether the person who is talking has a lot of resources. So again, I, I reviewed Andrew Huberman's ADHD video a few months ago, and he had three sources in the description. That's like, even if you don't know how to read scientific research and whatever, three sources for a three hour video, a two and a half hour video, it does not seem like a lot, and um, also, how can somebody make a video every week with so much information and be so sure of it? So I find that a good way to know hmm, this is a person maybe that I should be questioning. So don't do your research necessarily on every single person ever. But when somebody is overconfident, when he's making when they're making simple things sound or complex things sound very simple, there's probably more to it. Um, and be aware that a scientist will never say, just trust me, bro, and I'm 100% sure, they will say, to my best knowledge, this is it. But more research needs to be done, but that's what I think it is, or in my opinion, that's, I think, already a very good start. Um, but we have to be careful, because with ADHD, there's just way too many people who are misunderstanding, and so we should definitely, all of us should learn those foundations. Russell Barkley is a great place to go to learn them. Um, a couple of books, definitely not all books. <laughs> I'm afraid, and um, I'm originally Bulgarian, and um, Gabor Mate was recently the first book that I've ever seen on ADHD <laughs> in Bulgaria, and I was yeah. terrified. On the front cover, it was already written, you can be healed from ADHD, and like, what a dream, but you can't at, at the moment. And uh, mm. yeah. Don't, don't you know, Antonia? Uh, ADHD is actually entirely the parents' fault. In, in the 1960s, we had refrigerator mothers. You know, it was the mother's fault that children had autism. Um, so we just blame the mothers. We figured out that was wrong, but, but, but thank God, thank God for Gabor Mate, <laughs> because now he's realized it wasn't the parents' fault that kids had autism. It's actually the parents' fault that they have ADHD. So we, we got the letters a little bit wrong. It wasn't ASD, it was ADHD, but he's figured that out now. And um, so if we just blame parents enough, um, It'll fix the oh, problem. man. Especially like when it's one single person that's, that is like, hey, everybody else is getting it wrong. Guys, I figured it out. They usually haven't figured it out. Especially if they're overconfident. Yeah. Why, why is he writing it, alone if he knows so much? I find it scary. I, I find it scary as well because they have a very outsized influence. I've come across, um, like, let alone online, right? Like they go on massive podcast millions of people hear them millions of people who don't know much about adhd and then this person comes on and they're a doctor mm -hmm. and they're pretty mm -hmm. old and they you know look wise and knowledgeable and they speak with authority and they speak with confidence and gravitas and they're like this is adhd and i had it and 
they give you really intuitive sounding explanations, right? It sounds intuitive. Well, if you don't pick up a child, if you don't give them enough attention, they become hypersensitive and then that hypersensitive internalizes and there's anxiety. And then when they're really anxious, it looks like ADHD because you're jittery and you're hyperactive and you can't focus on things, right? It's a nice intuitive explanation. Um, it's wrong, it's just wrong, but like, <laughs> it's a very intuitive explanation. Imagine like, your mom finally decides to learn something about that ADHD thing and try to understand you and then she picks up a Gabor Mate book and she's like, well, actually, you're traumatized. <laughs> it's actually it's actually all your fault, mother. Yeah, and then maybe they okay. start blaming themselves and <laughs> nice. now it's worse because you're suffering yeah. and she's also suffering yeah. for absolutely no reason. So, uh, yeah. make, the, make disclaimers. People who don't make disclaimers yeah. are sus. <laughs> That's... That's and, and having a few good resources that you can yes. trust, I think, is a good start. Russell Barkley, definitely Russell Barkley. Russell Barkley, I, I would second Russell Barkley. It's a great channel, although very hard to digest content for, let alone ADHD people. True. Like it, it, it's hard to like some of it's like like he's like let me pull up three <laughs> PowerPoint slides and talk about them for an hour and a half. It's like okay, <laughs> this is we're in for a rough I have time. To say, that's my guilty pleasure. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be doing yeah. I'm gonna be like eating donuts, doing star jumps, and vacuuming the floor all at the same time while I'm trying to get through this video because <laughs> I need to increase the level of stimulation on this. I one. love science. You know why I love science? It's an ADHD thing because um if. If I have one thought, I can also make that a three of different thoughts. And with science, you can narrow that down a lot and have some level of certainty. So I can close at least a few of those branches and not have to think about them. So that I love that part of it, that it calms me down. I don't have to think of all the ideas that I have. 